Hey, hey, everyone, welcome to our inaugural CISO Talk LinkedIn Live discussion. I am excited. We're doing it late because I know a lot of you are sitting at home right now with nothing to do thanks to lockdown. And let's be honest, like, this is a pretty cool thing to be doing right now. So with that being said, though, before we get started, a shout out to Know Before for being a supporter of our show. You can find out more by going to cyberhubpodcast.com, but a shout out to Know Before for, um, you know, putting their money where their mouth is and supporting a, 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 a great CISO conversation. Joining me, though, is the one, the only, Naomi Buck Walter. Hello. Hello. What an intro. Thank you, James. Nice to be here. What's up, fam? What's going on? It's so great to finally do this. Like, you know, I'll, 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 it's, it's great to get a young, refreshing voice on the show. Oh, thanks, dude. Yes, I am young and I am somewhat refreshing. I just brushed my teeth. <laughs> I love it. The, a little bit of sense of humor for those today. So um, anyone tuning in on LinkedIn, you can comment below. We'll do our best not to embarrass ourselves by answering your questions. Um, if we don't know the question, we may just overall just let you know, hey, you know, great question. Conundrum time. Right? I mean, <laughs> there's something to be told about that. Hey, I um, got some riddles. I'll just shout them out. Some, <laughs> some good math riddles out there. <laughs> Naomi, so you have a very unique background, and while we start our first CISO uh, talk here on LinkedIn Live, I'm going to do it in the format. I always do it on the podcast that's been running for now, two years, tomorrow, two years, tomorrow. Hey, happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. I know. It's, it's, it's very, very exciting. May is a very big month, very, very big month. It's Mother's Day, it's Memorial Day, and it's my podcast birthday. Wow. So how are you going to celebrate? Um, I'm going to get the podcast a cake in the shape of a microphone mm -hmm. and I'm going to look at it because I can't eat sugar. And so I'll just stare at the cake. <laughs> okay. Maybe I'll take it to like a, a shelter or somewhere and just have people eat it. All right. I don't know whether to be happy for you or very depressed. Um, be happy. Be happy. Charity's, I'm happy. <laughs> charity's a good thing. <laughs> nice. Okay. So tell us a little bit about your, your, your background in cyber how you got started what was kind of like the path hmm well i answer this quite often and i usually tell a story um when i was a developer i took a course in hacking and it was probably the best moment of my life you ever remember taking a course or a, a class in school and you just have this moment where you realize there's something behind the curtain here right so you're sitting there all of a sudden you realize wait my mom and dad kind of suck they don't know anything it's like one of those moments where you're like wait all these things I'm building, it, it kind of sucks. So here I am in this hacking course. Uh, I fall in love with security. I fall in love with application penetration testing. And I contact the hiring manager for a role that was opening up. But it was too senior for me. So something about security and entry level, what do you know, right? There's no issues with that, right? So a completely entry level person, zero security experience. Um, and I went up to him, I'm like, hey, I am just dying to get into your team. What can I do? And he gave me like one thing. Hey, just start reading about security, seeing if you can break into your own apps uh, and, you know, do other kind of research things on your own. I'm like, OK, fine. About a month later, I came back to him. All right, what's next? What's next? You know, put me on your team, coach. I need this. I need this so bad. And I must have done something or scared him or something like that. But he ended up making a role just for me a junior level role on his application penetration testing team, essentially. And that is how I got started. And I haven't looked back since. And that was in, I want to say 2007, eight, one of those. I love the backgrounds of how people get started in cyber. You, like um, your, your interview number 80 for my yes. podcast. So you, you, you're, you're an even round number cool. and no stories the same, no stories identical. Right. They just they're so different. And, and that's awesome to hear. So when you let, let's talk a little bit, because you said someone gave you a chance. Someone yes. actually took a risk on you to get you in. And a lot of he times, did. you know, we hear about the cyber workforce shortage all the time. But what are some of the key skills and qualities you look for when you're hiring people now for your team? Yeah, I love somebody who's passionate. I mean, it, you can tell from their voice, the way they talk about their craft, right? And you could see from their 
their home lab, when they're talking about side projects, you can tell if they're active on GitHub. There is a level of passion that cannot be matched just by like taking a couple of certs or doing a couple of courses on co in college, right? There's just this level of enthusiasm that really just can't be uh, given to somebody. You have to just have it. So I look for passion overall, number one. Um, and then empathy is so huge, especially in security. If you cannot empathize or build relationships or have emotional intelligence, you won't get anything done. And it's just the short end of it. That's, um, that's so true. You know, skills and, and people in cyber, I was, I got a phone call yesterday from someone who's a mutual friend of someone I know who just started in the tech recruitment space and she, her question to me was uh, how do i speak to cyber people and i'm like well we're very special people we like to be viewed as very very special folk um, and most cyber i'd like to think that most of our industry get into this not because of the money but because the mission behind it we're actually making a difference and you kind of you had a great kind of saying right before we started and we went live here on linkedin you said if money didn't matter, what job would you do? Are you asking me? <laughs> I'm asking you. If, All right, if money didn't lying, matter, what job first. would you do? Uh, I'm, reversing, I'm reversing the order now. Hmm. If every job was worth the same economically, I guess, I yes. would probably try to maximize my value as a human. So there are so few, so many jobs with uh, low paying salaries, right? We're, th we're talking teachers. Um, artists, anyone who really caters to the human side of things. And if you think about it, we actually get paid more the more we act like computers. So here I am sitting like basically a black box working from home now, input, yeah. output, great, all day long. Um, I would rather, I mean, honestly, I would rather teach something. And since I, my passions in security, I would teach security. Yeah, final answer, Alex. All right, thank you. For yeah. uh, those watching on LinkedIn, you can ask any question you want in the comment section. We'll do our best not to embarrass ourselves and answer those for you. Um, any insight, um, even if you've, you know, want to answer the questions I'm asking Naomi, do so in the comment section below. Now, so what type of skills do you think security leaders need, Naomi? Oh my gosh, I know you've you've asked this question in previous I, podcasts. I, my 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 podcasts are very very structured in questions mm -hmm. right everyone gets the same questions there's no except there's no um so so no one can say he discriminates he's throwing softballs to this person or that person i've had that happen before and oh i've my. also had john mcafee on the show and so you know that 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 tends to do um um you know, that tends to do something to it. And plus, I think having a structured, uniform interview gives my listeners the opportunity to hear different points of view on topics that matter. And I didn't craft these questions. These mm. questions were crafted by our audience because like a questions we're getting from Spencer now where he goes, what certs do you need as a minimum to get into cyber? And he's got several certs in his name, <laughs> right? So it's it's it matters, right? Yeah. Uh, so I'll well, like to I give say everyone that, a fair chance. That's true. I say that because I've watched previous episodes um, and I kind of fell in love with your podcast. So I'm a huge fan. Um, and I hear Thank a you. lot of the same. Oh, I, I hear <laughs> a lot of the same answers. They need emotional intelligence and empathy um, and, you know, really learning the business. Uh, and I agree with that. Everything about that is 100 percent true. Um, the cyber leaders that I work with uh, have worked with in the past have either been really, really good at building relationships or not so good. And it's just not cyber security leaders, it's leadership in general. Um, you really want to be able to connect with the people you want to influence and help, essentially. So um, it's a great way of um, just having people on board with you, winning hearts and minds. Yeah, skills, leadership skills is something that isn't discussed a lot among CISOs, right? Because I feel like it, and, and everyone kind of caters to the whole idea of you know see security people aren't people people they're computer people and they live in this dark basement and they wear hoodies and they're not very sociable and they put headphones on their ears 
and I don't know, we're into like Matrix, I guess, blue pill, red pill, because that's a thing now anyway, socially. <laughs> and so <laughs> like, and that's so not true. Security people are people people. We do our work because we're people people trying to stop computer people from getting to people people. <laughs> Did that make any sense? I love that. That's great. I'm going to tattoo that right on my arm. I'm a people person. <laughs> and so, so real quick to answer Spencer's question. So what certs do you need as a minimum, depending on what you want to do, right? If you want to go into pen testing, you go and you get your, you know, certified ethical hacker, right? Or your pen plus, at, you know, CompTIA, one of those two. Do you, mm -hmm. do you value one cert over another, Naomi? Well, Spencer, you're not going to like my answer. <laughs> I say if you're an entry level person and you're just getting into it, um, it's probably better not to just go for straight for a cert. You don't really have that overall scope of what you're trying to do, what information security is trying to do within an organization. And if you're just going to go for your CEH or your Security Plus or your A Plus, that gives you a great amount of knowledge in one specific area. But what you really need, what you truly need, is an all encompassing view of what security is. It's so many other domains than just one or two little things or system administration or something like that. And I'm really glad that you asked this question because a lot of people do. And I always tell them, follow your passion. Just go down that rabbit hole, just like the matrix, go down the rabbit hole first and see what you love about security and go down deeper. And from there kind of branch out. So be like amazing at one really cool thing about security and then gradually branch out from there and then by the time you're ready to take a cert you've got two or three years of experience of just playing around hack the boxes building a home lab just messing around on the internet really without going to jail you're too pretty for jail spencer <laughs> so the idea is just just do what you want with learning and then go ahead and study for the cert because your passion is going to show up so much more as um, an impressive accomplishment than getting one or two certs. But eventually when you become more senior, you will want to get something like a CISSP, a CISM, and, but it really depends on where you want to specialize. Yeah, it depends on what, what, what part of cyber you want to go in. And I think most people think it's all about pen testing and being a CISO, but there's you know threat hunters, security researchers, you know blue teamers, there's so much to it so much to it there's so many aspects of cyber and in cyber architecture cyber engineering <laughs> orchestration audit yeah audit analysts mm -hmm. i mean it's endless and we need every single brain type in cyber in order to win the war against the uh you know computer people that are trying to take advantage of people people using computers right or or end users <laughs> who don't mean to do it but they end up doing it <laughs> spencer gives you a, a big shout out of thanks and uh, you're very welcome, Spencer. Um, make sure you subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> subscribe. So, subscribe now, please. Um, <laughs> you know, so you kind of look at a role of a system. We speak of leadership within just running a security team. But what about the skills we need across the enterprise to really break barriers and elevate the role of a CISO? Yeah, this one's a good question. I... I once had a job where I wasn't in love with the mission. It was, I won't give the company name away, but it had to do with basically email and spam. And it was just not spam, but it was just like basically making email look pretty. And I wasn't on board with the mission. I never felt that connection. Um, and I loved working for the company. The people there were great. Um, but I never was able to cross over from the engineering team and really make relationships to the finance team or to the legal department or marketing, it was really hard for me to push those boundaries and push through that wall and just say, hey, I'm really on board with your mission, guys. Trust me to make the right decisions for your business because I kind of didn't feel it. I didn't have that like passion for email like the rest of the team did and completely get it. Like Some people have their passions and email can be really, really fun, but to me, it was just email you know it wasn't like the greatest thing in the world so you know eventually i realized in order to really make connections across departments and with other leaders within the business you really have to be on board with the mission i know that sounds corny right uh, i'm sorry but no, the, no, the it, but i don't think it sounds corny i think that was the the challenge that early cisos had if you look at the kind of how the role has elevated over the last decade right initial cisos were so focused on security there were the no people 
hence mm-hmm. why people don't like security folks in organizations. And over time, and over especially the last three to four years, CISOs have needed to become business people and not just security people. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, that's another tattoo for my right arm here. So <laughs> I'm running out of room there, James. More tattoos. More tattoos. <laughs> no one's going to like, you're going to go to like a job interview. And if you, what, what's I up just, with, I am people, people from not against computer people. <laughs> it's my crib sheet. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's it's skills outside of security it's understanding the business and it, oftentimes as we kind of look at this you look at where CISOs spend their most time on from a security perspective so where do you spend the most time on like what aspect of security are you really focused on in your day to day oh that's a good question too um i i sometimes hear the analogy that security is like a doctor or a dentist and you really don't want to see your doctor or dentist uh, unless there's something wrong. Like it's you have to brush your teeth, you have to floss, you have to take care of your body, you have to eat healthy. That's kind of what security has been. I, the more I thought about it, we're not really doctors. We're more of the immune system for the body. Like we want to be part of the organization. Why are we constantly thinking we're outside of it? And we're a doctor trying to like cure the diseases of security, poor security practice. You know, like why are we? Why do we say it like that? But if we consider ourselves more as part of the organization and we're leading from the inside, yeah, we'll build that healthy immune system. We're going to make it part of the culture. Security should be part of the culture of the company. If you have a strong security culture, one, the user, the users, your employees, your team members are going to be really, really into it. They're going to say, wow, security is good for my company and I am going to try my darndest and every single little thing that I think is suspicious, I'm going to report. You know, all these things add up. Uh, security awareness is huge, but making it fun, making it accessible, making it exciting. These are the kind of things that are challenges for security practitioners today. It's not just the emotional intelligence and relationship building, but it is really delving into a business and an organization and being part of the culture. Usually it's separate for some reason. It's like, hi, I'm security all by myself. But really, if you dive in and build advocates within the business, within the organization, you're going to do so much more than if you're just knocking on the door, help, I need help with this one thing. No, you need advocates. You need people to fight for you. Um, You know, right now I have a great boss and I realize I have got I've got a good one and he fights for me and I know it, too. And there's probably a really good reason for it. I won't tell you why, but (laughs) he understands the importance of security, if you get my meaning. I work so much better now that I have a good relationship with somebody at his level who can just go across and explain things in really plain English and be like, hey, we stand to lose this if this uh, thing doesn't happen. And I love having that advocate. One, I get a little nervous when I talk to senior leaders, so he's able to do that for me. And I really like learning from him, too. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to remember this the next time for the next job. So it's something I appreciate. Yeah, it takes a good person to advocate for you that has the ears when you get into a role and that also is able to understand the the landscape of an organization. I think it's so a lot of times you can tell a lot about an organization by just looking at it online, like just studying behavior on LinkedIn, studying behavior on Twitter, seeing the, how the company tweets and what they tweet and what like. All those things kind of help you understand um, 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 culture a little bit and having, you know, spreading that across and spreading security across an organization is so critical. And your energy alone just makes me want to like, just like shadow you for a day just to see like how you do it. Like, I'm just like, I wonder how that would look like in a break room somewhere. You know, just just to see you, you know, what are you guys, you know, let's talk. Oh, man, I'll bit. tell you stories. We have fun over, you know, October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. No, um, and we, you no. don't say. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. So we do fun things. We do we do block picking villages. We do um, Slack GIF contests. Like we do all these fun things that are relevant and fun and, and young. And, you know, it's just it's better than what I grew up with in in security. It was just like computer training once a year, policy training once a year. It's so dry, you know? Also being approachable, honestly, a lot of security folks that I've seen, I've worked with, not so approachable. It's usually like, no, we're gonna do it this way. Sorry, not sorry. 
you know, and they do that whole like, oh, I can't believe they even asked, you know, and it's just not cool. It's just not cool. You're a person like be human, please be kind. There's such a level of empathy that's missing from so many people in security. And I'm sorry, guys, if I'm throwing you under the bus, not guys, just everyone, anyone, um, you know, let's learn from each other. Let's learn from the failures of our industry. There's there's endless amounts of evidence that the way we've been doing things probably isn't the right way of doing things, right? If we need our end users to be at last layer eight, teach them, but make it fun make it so they understand and make them have that same passion. That's so true. If we just learn a little bit from not just our mistakes, but other people's successes. And that's the whole point of this podcast, right? The whole point of this podcast is come share what you're doing really well. So other people could do the same exact thing. So we can learn and build because the only way we learn and build, yeah, you know, there's a saying, you know, you learn more from failure than success. And I'm like, maybe personally, but as a group, I think we learn more from successes than failures. Yeah, I hear you. Right. What, so, what kind of success do you have you seen with uh, security awareness and specifically? From a security awareness perspective, what success have I seen? Or were you able to make, you know, well, change? Uh, so I think security awareness is all about making it personal. And so understanding with security leaders, like when I go across an organization as a CISO and I speak to my CIO, CTO, CMO, CSO, CEO, COO, CFO, I, I want to understand, I want to understand them on a personal level of what they care about. And then I try to relate security to that because typically leaders their teams mimic the leaders. So if you understand the leader of every team, you're able to create a, a, a specific set of messages to cultivate a message to that team that will resonate with the leader of the team that will increase awareness and adoption of security across an organization. And so I try to always get to know the person, get security to them on a personal level, whether it be, you know, I'm worried about my kids, We've all seen the to catch a predator online. So like, you know, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had where people will tell me, listen, I'm really worried about what my teenage kids are doing in chat rooms, through games, through apps online. And I don't know where to even get started. So I have like this sheet and I go, here you go. Here's all the things you can do on your kid's phone to ensure that you have this stuff. Helps. It, 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 it helps a little bit that that's kind of the stuff that I've done. But now going back to you for a minute, <laughs> this is all about, you know, me, not me. I, I do the show weekly. Uh, I do stuff every single day. People hear enough of me. This is about you. So what security project did you enjoy working on the most and why? Now, me for a second here, we have lost your audio and your video has frozen. So for those watching the uh, podcast here on LinkedIn Live, we're actually going to go off live. We're going to continue um, recording this um, and you'll be able to listen to it on our podcast, CISO Talk, and your favorite podcast listening platform. But because Naomi's voice has gone and in order to restart this live feed would take um, um, a pain, it would just create one more thing. We're going to transition to a, um, we're going to transition to our normal audio video podcast here and you can tune in and I'll post the link on the bottom of this video once we post it tomorrow. Um, so Naomi, you can, they can't hear you. So I'm gonna say bye on your behalf because I can hear you just fine, but there's an issue with, I'm going to blame LinkedIn for this one because it's, it's really not us at this point because I can hear Naomi on my end, but on LinkedIn, it is absolutely frozen. I guess they haven't. Like Azure ran out of cloud space in uh, <laughs> in Europe. Um, um, LinkedIn has run out of bandwidth for LinkedIn Lives. So um, for everyone watching, uh, we'll answer your questions, I promise, on uh, the audio podcast. You can go to your favorite podcast listening platform, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, anywhere you listen, just put in CISO Talk. You'll find this episode posted there tomorrow. Um, that's it for us here. Um, more on this 
on our audio podcast. All right, everyone, for those, um, we're listening to the earlier section. We were on LinkedIn Live. We had a little issue, most likely dolphins. Um, and if you don't know what I mean by dolphins, you'll have to listen to my Tech Corner podcast on the Cyber Hub podcast channel with the great uh, JJ from No Before. Uh, she was in Australia. I'm in Atlanta. And dolphin sonar was hindering our fiber optic line communication underwater. We blamed it on dolphins because sharks get a bad enough rep. And Nemo, as we all know, is in an aquarium in Sydney. And so he can't interfere with that signal. And Naomi, we're back. Great. <laughs> people were I'm glad like, to be here. People were like eager to, um, to, to continue to hear you on LinkedIn. And so I do apologize for those that are LinkedIn and now listening. Um, I will re-examine this and figure this out. Um, I can tell you that what you didn't hear from Naomi is on the recording, so you can hear it. You probably heard it already as you jump now to minute 28 to listen to this thing. So with that being said, Naomi, where we left off was what challenges do you see practitioners starting to overcome? Yeah, and it answered the focus, uh, ability to focus on one thing as a community uh, and really agreeing on kind of talking about one thing. And right now that's privacy and kind of seeing where privacy falls under the domain and umbrella of information security. That's what I'm seeing these days. Well, so here's the thing about privacy though. Privacy is more of a compliance issue. Oh, it it's, totally is. It's, it's not what cybersecurity practitioners want to get, get better at or, or overcome the challenge. It's simply because across the entire organization, everyone understands one thing. If we don't do this, then the government's going to be up in our business. Oh, yeah. And no one wants the government up in their business. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know where you're going with this. It's really not our responsibility. It's not one of the seven domains, you know, like, how dare you? But I, I don't know. It's just been kind of a, a fit for us. Like, who else would, if you don't have a legal counsel... Uh, in your team like who else would it really go to the cfo well maybe they're not so great with privacy law you know like um you know security is kind of a almost a good fit but in our organization uh, there really is no one else so i'm happy to take that on i've actually found a kind of a, not a real passion for it but i can appreciate it so i am studying for the cipp um so i'll put that out there on the internet in case i ever fail it so i can look back and be all shames. Well, <laughs> I don't want you to be ashamed. I will tell you, I, I'm a CISO for a biometrics company. And when you talk about privacy, talk about collecting biometrics. There's no clear law, even though GDPR defines the right to your privacy as also being your biometrics. CCPA does has similar language to GDPR. Very, very interesting. I will tell you, yes, I've, 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 I've spent as much time as you have on privacy. Um, you've probably spent a little bit more because I have lawyers that do a lot of the research and come back with all this different case law. But there is something very interesting about privacy and security. But if you have security, then you'll have privacy. But if you don't have security, you may not have privacy. Mm -hmm. This is true. Another tattoo. Another tattoo. Left arm. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Great. <laughs> we've, we've filled the right arm with quotes. Now we're going to the left arm. Yes. And I'll have to quote you too. What challenges are we, um, do you think we still need to master? What's the challenge we still need to overcome in security? Uh, you know, being just better storytellers almost where you want to influence somebody really, and you mentioned this, getting real personal and trying to tell them how this would affect you personally. If you can get down to their level and, and explain to them in a very lucid way and say like this is a story i'm going to tell you that could happen not really scaring them although sometimes that does work but being better storytellers within an organization it would just bring us miles ahead of where we are now instead of just talking technical all the time um just being able to slightly make it easier to understand and uh, that that would be where stories come in analogies sports analogies sports analogies are great um any analogy, I, I like to use presentations with people where it's just pictures and no words. People relate to pictures. Yeah, totally. A thousand words, right? Yeah, like people do relate to pictures. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to say that. So let me ask you this, Naomi. As a cybersecurity community, what are some of the best practices? What are some of the things that we do really well to help each other, in your opinion? Like, what do you see from your community? Yeah, great question. 
So I think we are great at responding to requests for help. And what I mean by that is if you just look on LinkedIn or Twitter, if you at somebody and you maybe mention something on their uh, feed or something like that, sometimes they'll get back to you. If you have a legitimate question and you really want to talk, people will reach back out to you. Now, if you're selling something, then maybe not. But if you're just legitimately looking for help, then the cyber community will come back with advice. I love that about our community. It's great. What I don't think we do well right now is actually reaching out for help. So even though the people who do reach out for help get the help that they're asking for, to make that initial step and to say, I'm just going to ask for help. That part's hard for a lot of people, especially new folks. And what I've done like on LinkedIn, I, I'm doing right now a series of mock interviews for anyone who asks. And I've gotten a, a bunch of different levels, a security analyst from a noob IT specialist kind of thing. I even had a VP of information security and CISO do a mock interview. And it's just because I opened it up and said, hey, I'd like to learn more about you. And um, if I could help in any way, let's do a mock interview. And I got so many connections within uh, like three days. I got 27 interviews scheduled and I just did one today. Did a couple last yesterday. You know, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Just How'd learning. they go? How'd the interviews go? I think they went really well. I mean, I just ask questions and I love asking questions and especially tricky ones. Like, what port does ping use? You know, and people are like, oh, don't get me on that one. That's terrible, terrible question. So, um, but I, I just like, I don't know, seeing what people, how people tick and how people work. And I, I just love talking to new people, I guess. And they've been going really well, I think. So it's it's, I saw you post this a few days ago as well, that you were doing a mock interview. And I was gonna kind of like maybe create a fake profile and approach it and just be like, I'm wondering what kind of questions she's gonna ask me in my mock interview. So what's your typical, like, how do you start your interview? What is like the, you know, beyond just getting to know the person, like tell me about yourself. What is like your first maybe technical getting to know the person question like? Mm. Uh, in general, I always ask, what's the function of information security within an organization? What's the purpose of InfoSec? Uh, and sometimes I'll get the answer I'm looking for, which is just to be a business enabler and to keep risk away from the organization. Sometimes I'll, I'll hear answers where I'm like, no, that's completely wrong. Like, for example, uh, someone said, well, I'm just here to make sure they don't go to jail or <laughs> like no one gets in trouble and compliance, compliance, compliance. Uh, and, and I'm such a risk-based person, not a compliance-based person. I, I was just like, oh, the answer. But it made a lot of sense coming from where he was because he had a heavily regulated industry. He was coming from um, oil and gas. And like, I totally get it. You have your rules and you have to follow them. You get audited every other day. I get that. But for somebody in the private sector who might not have that regulatory oversight, um, that is absolutely not the answer I'm looking for. So I'm also practicing as an interviewer, trying to phrase the question to fit the profile of the interviewee. And I can't just generally ask a question like, what's InfoSec and what does it do in your organization? Um, and it really also depends on the level of uh, expertise of the person and what the role they're trying to go for. So the prep talk that we have beforehand is like, just give me what you're going for and maybe what industry you're looking to do, looking to get into. And then I kind of tailor the questions from there. And then I do ask kind of technical questions like, if you, like, where does SSL, you know, stop it within a network? You know, like stuff like that. Just general questions on security. Like th those are great questions. I want, you know, what would be really cool is if we um, posted some of your questions, right? And get people like gather some answers and get people to vote for the, you know, and then post them in a poll and see what people vote for as being the best answer to that question. I've always felt like job, uh, I'll tell you one thing I ask. Interns, people I interview all the time is, tell me about a breach you followed. Why'd you follow that breach? Like, what about that breach attracted you to follow it and why? Like, what's your favorite breach? I know that's mm -hmm. a, like, and, and I get a lot of blank stares. I get like <laughs> Equifax. I hear a lot of Equifax. Equifax, that's the only one I can think of. Right, because right then and there, they're in they're in this position of, I'm in a job interview, I'm really nervous, I really wanna get this job. say something. <laughs> I, and, and I don't wanna come out as a, as, as a thing, so I'll say Equifax. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, and whenever they say Equifax, I'm like, I've now started to, 
Excluding Equifax, what's your favorite breach? Dude, I got breached um, as part of that. It was a DOD, that huge, what was the name OPM? of it? OPM? Yes, that was me. I was in there because I worked for the uh, Department of Justice. We all were. We yeah, all we were. all were. Yeah. We all were. So I, my I favorite breach too. is the one where I was breached. <laughs> Completely sucks. Yeah, OPM was one thing. Um, and, and again, but when you go back to 2013 and 14 and you look at those breaches, it's today we look at it and we go, well, what were they thinking? Well, let's go back to 2013 and 14 and think about it. What were they thinking? They weren't thinking that's going to happen. Yeah, exactly. Because it hadn't happened before. Right, right. Right? Yeah, yeah they got my, well, it's all old information anyway. At least that's what I'm telling myself <laughs> to this day. Well, it was funny because at the time I had been applying to be in, in the FBI. And I remember just getting the letter you know, your information has been stolen, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, what the hell? <laughs> like, this is not cool. And at that time, I had gone through a background check. So I was like, well, this is shitty. Now I have all this stuff. I don't even know what they had on me. I did an FOIA request. But it was just like, I everything's redacted. I have no idea what they had on me. But it was just, I was like, oh, I feel so betrayed right now, people. Like, it was not good. It was not pretty. I love redacted um, reports. I love them. Um, I love them because I'm one of those that tries to like find out what they redacted. <laughs> so I'm. A, a, did, I, did you enjoy doing puzzles as a kid? Yeah, absolutely. So think of a redacted report like a bunch of pieces of a puzzle. Think of, as you put it together, you start to put together a picture of a puzzle, and now you got to start filling it in. And there's ways to fill it in, hmm. and so. I've, You're gonna I've, have to I'll, teach me your ways. I I will I will do my best to teach you your ways. Not on the podcast though. I don't <laughs> want to have them knocking on my door at like five a.m. Um, Mr. Azar, uh, open your front door. We're here to talk to you. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> they, 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 they 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 scare me a little bit. What, <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. So my, my for, for for disclosure, my wife's Israeli. Right. Mm -hmm. My wife hates when I talk about her on the podcast, but guess what? You're going to get it. And Israel and Israelis in general, for people who serve, every, everyone there is required to serve in the military. And it's very awkward for me because when I moved to Israel and lived in Israel, people were like very much like fans of the government. And I'm like, you trust your government like that? Like blindly? Like, mm. I don't trust any government blindly. Like, why are you invading my, why do you get to listen to my calls? Why, if I go somewhere, I get asked questions about why I went there. Like, I get you're at a con you have really bad neighbors. I get it. But liberty is something very, very important. And privacy oh, yeah, totally. is something very important as well. Mm -hmm. And during this COVID pandemic, my wife has been very strict and obedient to directions that come out of the government. And I'm, on the other hand, like... They can't tell me what to do. There's a line. I've got a bill of rights. There is a constitution here. And if they infringe on my constitution, I will bear arms to fight for my Hell rights. Hell yeah, preach. Yeah, there you go. And, and she just looked at me and she goes, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, I have liberties. Those are God-given liberties because yeah. you were born in this nation. and Or if you immigrate in this nation and you get... Um, a resident status or you become a citizen you these are your liberties and even if you're a guest in our nation even if you're a guest in this country you're given the same civil right liberties and as anyone else and that's what makes this country great i love it yeah and you fought for those rights thank you for right. your service exactly the, yeah like no like i i no, no one's going to tell us to quarantine for six months and no one wants to live off the government. And I'm not going to say no one, but I'm saying like, we shouldn't want to have that. That's not what this, this not the founding principles of our country. There are plenty of countries where you can go do that too. I can give you an entire list and you're free to immigrate there. Free. <laughs> no, thanks. Free. That will be my deny list. <laughs> right? going that, like, that, like, <laughs> I love, I love, um, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's crazy. Okay. I'm going to go on. Uh, I'm going to bring us back because that, I love talking politics. Just bring it. I love well, politics, man. It's, it's not that it's, it's, we work in cybersecurity, right? We, mm -hmm. I realize that as security practitioners, we all work with law enforcement and there's great law enforcement out there. This, that, what I said was not meant to take away from, you know, the people who dedicate their lives at the FBI or at any of the three letter intelligence agencies or even the police force. But 
they're they're volunteers fighting for our liberties and our justice then we have elected politicians that somehow rule over volunteers <laughs> uh, and they're bought out by you know corporations right and... special interests yeah like mm, you gotta take the money out of politics james money out of politics our democracy is fascinating so yes. Over the last few days, you obviously one of the things uh, I've been talking about is this shadow war that's been going on between Israel and Iran for like 10 years since Stuxnet essentially is now front and center. Like over the last few weeks, it's cyber attack. The, the Iranians tried to hack the uh, water facilities in Israel. Israel returned fire by hacking the main port in Iran and shutting it down. Like, I don't know. The, the U.S. media didn't cover this. Believe but it. Yeah. L- let me tell you something. The, I was looking at satellite footage and the port out of Iran had probably an 18 mile line of trucks waiting to get in. And it had ships that couldn't even pull into port. You know, if you've ever flown to Asia, like Hong Kong or, you know, like a major port city or, or Guangzhou, Guangzhou or, you know, Tokyo, like any yeah, yeah. of those port cities, San Diego, there's always just massive amount of container ships out there mm-hmm. iran's never had that they had like th- their patrol boats couldn't even patrol between all those boats that couldn't oh. unload <laughs> like they completely paralyzed their port and that was like a wow. sh- that was like a shot across the bow of just letting him know wow. like don't come after our critical infrastructure because we'll paralyze yours Damn. and then he le- yesterday or, or you know yesterday for israel because it's now friday morning in israel for us it was this morning the Iranians hacked a bunch of private businesses in Israel and took over, like they, they went on a defacement mm. attack and defaced a bunch of um, municipality sites and a lot of private business sites. And they launched a few ransomware attacks on some companies that were able to do that. Mm. Now, here's the difference between the US. Here we have CISA and CISA does an amazing job of responding to this kind of stuff. Yeah. In Israel, they also have the INCD. So the INCD went full-fledged helping people recover. And so now Israel's going to retaliate. And I'm just sitting there watching, watching. And oh, God. if you're a fan of our podcast, you should listen to the interview I did with Ohad Zeidenberg. He's the founder of the CTI League, but he also works for Clear Sky Security. And I don't typically have vendors on the show, but I've known Ohad for a few years. He's an amazing person and an expert, speaks Persian, reads Persian, an expert in Iran. That's what he did in the military in Israel. He now works for Clear Sky, which they, all they do is uh, they do threat intel on Iran. And he gave an insight into Iranian nuclear uh, cyber activities. Sorry, not nuclear. We did talk about that a little bit. But Iranian cyber activities, that's just fascinating. And if you don't follow Ohad on Twitter, you should. The guy posts stuff out there before CISA even reports it. All right. What's his handle? Um, I don't know. I will post it. I will. I will let In the you. Links. <laughs> hang on. I'll. I'll tell you right his handle right now. Let me just pull it up here on Twitter. But while we do that, what are some of your best practices for security? Yes. Uh, like personal security. Yes. Oh, all right. Well, uh, patch everything. Uh, run a VPN. Keep your router up to date. Uh, password manager. Different passwords for every site. Unique passwords. Two factor authentication. Uh, just make sure you're not connecting to public Wi-Fi. All these fun things. I should really make a list of these. You should. Yeah, um, I should. Just, just to let you know, it's them. Ohad MZ, Oscar Hotel Alpha Delta, mm. Mike Zulu. Okay, thank. Oh, he's a doctor. Jeez. He's not a doc. Is he a doctor? MD. <laughs> okay, I just uh, assumed. Uh, no, no. Ohad M- MZ, not MD, MZ, oh, Mike Zulu. Okay. Got it. Cool. Thank you. And, uh, and I feel I do feel a little bit behind with that news. Is there a good source for that information? That's um, Jerusalem Post is a good one. Okay. Al Jazeera, um, if you want the spin, um, like I like to get both sides of the story. So I'll read like a Jerusalem Post. I read Hebrew, and so I'll read the um, um, you know like uh, stuff in Hebrew, and then I'll watch. You know, Israel's news media is pretty much similar to the U.S. You have right wing, left wing, and then you know people who try to be somewhere in the middle. And so I, I try to get a bunch of different points of views. Um, but then I speak to people who are, you know, actually doing this and they're awesome. So, you know, I, I got to let, let's get into our like CISO insight round. 
Um, let's do it. Let's do that. Hang on just one second. I got to put up, uh, I, I do have a very cool image for this. So yes, here we go. So for those, um, if you're not seeing, you can watch us on YouTube. And so you can go back and look at that, but you know, here it is. All right. So this is a one word only. You're on the hot seat. We have a bunch of questions for you and you only get to answer the first one with only one word, one buzzword you would get rid of forever. Blacklist. <laughs> Why? That's the first, by the way. We've never had blacklist. 80 episodes, never blacklist. Uh, I bet people say cyber, huh? Um, no, people say AI, ML. People will say oh, no, zero blacklist. trust. Listen, it's 2020. Blacklist could be misconstrued into something racist. I'm telling you, whitelist, blacklist has got to go. Deny so, list, allow list. Get it in your heads. Deny list, allow list. I like that. Thanks, I like man. that. I like that. I'll start using that. Deny list, allow list. Deny list, allow list. Deny list, allow list. You oh, say something yes. three times, it becomes embedded in your <laughs> Tattoo brain. Tattoo it on your arm. Tattoo yes. it right here. Deny list, allow list. Then I can put on the deny list, all boys that come talk to my daughter. Allow list. <laughs> all her girlfriends that are nice that come from good homes. <laughs> That's why you got to flex right there and be like, this is your answer right here. This right muscle. here. Right. <laughs> um, I, work out. I, I have great stuff planned for her first date. That, oh boy, God. I oh pity God. that boy, I pity him, I pity him. I You're going to have two shotguns or what? No, like God, no. Guns don't scare boys anymore. I never, I never oh. got scared from guns. There's a good one. Um, our wrestling coach in high school, he, he had a very, very good one. He would answer the door with a dirty shovel. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then he would talk to the boy with the most utmost respect utmost attention and the boy wouldn't know what's going on and then the boy throughout conversation would be like you know what's up with the shovel and be like oh i've been doing some yard work let me show you and there's oh a grave in the backyard and he goes touch or hurt my daughter and you'll be buried here <laughs> and he was a navy seal and he goes i'm a navy <gasps> seal i can get oh, away yeah. with it i can get away with it that's good <laughs> That's yeah. that's 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 beyond the gun. That's beyond the knife. That's beautiful. That is, yeah. That, that is, is like, really. And he's already dug a hole. He's got a hole in the backyard. Oh, that's for dug. every single new date. Not that's for impressive. every single new date. I think he just, just dug the like, one. Okay. like a hole, <laughs> right? And he touches it up. Like he'll go dig like maybe yeah, 10, 15 minutes, <laughs> right before. But he's got like a six foot long hole. Probably oh, not. You know, like it's good. What would be more impressive if he did have a different hole for every date and like covered up the other ones? So I'd be like, you're the 89th hole. <laughs> See, I have a lot of trees in my backyard. Mm -hmm. So I could probably tell him like every tree here is made from a human heart. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That would be good. Yeah. Um, one technology that will change the way we do cyber forever. Uh, isolation as a service. Interesting. Get that one in. Yeah, it's coming. Last book you read and why? The Passage by Justin Cronin. And why? Don't hate me. I love pandemics, man. I do. I'm sorry. This is like my my shit. I'm sorry. Like, I love it. <laughs> so like right now you're like, oh my God, I'm living in it's a real a life book. No, it's so boring though. Like, this is not what the movies tell. I thought there would be more running and screaming, honestly. And more like riots. I just want to see chaos. Well, there are yeah. riots, but... Right, true. <laughs> there are not riots. Not in my privileged society. Um, You know... Look at Michigan, California. Th there are riots there. I mean, people are out in the streets. Yeah, I am very privileged to be here where I am. Yeah. Sorry, America. Sorry, America. Sorry, America. Sorry, America. Sorry, America. Where are you at anyways? I can't disclose that, OSINT. Come on. Okay, I'm sorry. People can look me up anyway. <laughs> so if they know, why can't you say? <laughs> uh, who knows? Maybe somebody is listening like, yeah, my husband doesn't like that. I'll just say I'm in the uh, near New York City, Philadelphia region. <laughs> See, that region is, is, well, you're not next to New York City, which is, you're not in New York, which is great because like 30,000 people died in New York. And somehow yeah. Como's like a great, the America's governor. America's governor's lost 30,000 of his own citizens. Yeah. Sorry, my award goes to Ron DeSantis in Florida. 
Florida oh, yeah? has he the oldest the population. Has the oldest population <laughs> in the. That's where old people go. Like they go to Arizona or Florida. Those are like the two landing spots. And he's got like five thousand dead people. Good for him. Only Ron 5, DeSantis, dead. my Ron the governor DeSantis. of America, Ron DeSantis. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, let him out, man. Let him out. Yeah. Last movie you saw. Uh. Oh, um, Armageddon. I told okay, you, I like, wow. I like Apocalypse. It was on TV. Wow. I swear to God. I swear to God, it was on TV last night. Um, listen, I love it when the world ends. Like, I'm going to be so excited. Armageddon. Like, Dude, you're... you have no idea. You have no idea how much I love Apocalypse books. So stuff. have you no seen idea. like, um, what's, what's it called? Um, tomorrow. Um, the one where. The day like, after tomorrow. Day after tomorrow. Yeah. That was, yeah, of course. Okay. I read the original World War Z. Come on. Like, I am all about pandemics and stuff. Like, I just love the chaos that goes around and the exp- survival. That explains so much about your risk-based approach to security. <laughs> now I get it. It all comes together. See the pieces of the puzzle. They oh all my come gosh, together. Yes. You can help me figure out what was under the, uh, the, the blank, redactus. the black, yeah, yes. the redacted parts. There's they plenty. didn't do such a great job. I could still see. It was just black highlighter, right? I can I could still see. I'm like, Well, it's a black guys. Sharpie, right? They Sharpie, put, right, right. I could Sharpie. still kind of see. Like if I zoomed in, I could kind of see it. I still have the CD somewhere in storage. There's a way. There's a way. Tell me. Tell me your ways. There's a way. I your favorite know what music. They know. Your favorite music. Hmm. All right, don't laugh. I promise I won't. You're going to laugh. I might. I like show tunes. <laughs> <laughs> you, damn it. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Sometimes I listen to opera. People laugh at me for that too. I like show tunes. But you, you promise you wouldn't laugh. You laughed. I'm so sorry. Well, that's okay. I, I, I can't be held accountable. Like, I love when people say, like, promise you won't get mad. I can't promise that. Just say what you got to <laughs> say. I'll do my best not to get mad. Just fake it. Just be like, you're the coolest person with the coolest taste in music show tunes. Show tunes are awesome. Like what kind of show tunes? Uh, Well, I'm talking about classics like Les Mis. I listen to that as my focus music. And then when I want to get crazy, I listen to Chicago. Wow. Yeah. uh, I think one of the only show tunes I've listened to is the soundtrack to the Book of Mormon. Oh, that's a good one. There's a lot of classics in there. There's great stuff in there. Oh, yeah. A lot of people go for Hamilton when you talk show tunes, but that's just Mm. because Hamilton got like mainstreamed, like overly mainstreamed. Yeah. Right? Like plays are plays. Like musicals are, (laughs) leave them in theaters. Let them be done expertly in New York and then Mm -hmm. brought with like the the JV team to every other city in America. (laughs) The okay. JV team. Yeah. You know they do too. That is the JV the team. You don't get the originals. You don't get the originals. Right. Like you no. go to a play, you're like, that's that's not no. <laughs> no. Who hired this guy? What is he yeah, from? Like, totally. What is he from? Like community theater? <laughs> <laughs> wow, harsh. I feel gypped. <laughs> I will I, never sing in front of a person, like ever, not even like my husband, because it's just so nerve wracking. So I totally admire those people who can stand up there and belt it out night after night, like show after show. Damn. They do two Damn, shows a day is in New like, York. I know. Sh- How do they? Literally. But, but they the do float. have a JV team in New York. Like okay. if you go to like a 2.30 show on like a Wednesday, mm-hmm. you're not getting the entire cast. I'm not getting the A team, yeah. Right. Yeah, you're right. Like the you're two, right. three main role is going to be like the guys, oh, hey, they're they're filling in for, you know, Lin-Manuel Miranda or whatever his name is. <laughs> yeah, right? that's it. <laughs> like, like dudes on Jimmy Fallon right now, like uh, yeah, bugging yeah, something yeah. out. Like, yeah, yeah. How annoying. Or you get Russell Crowe as right. like, you know, lame is. God, like how terrible. how annoying is it to to um to to realize that like Jimmy Kimmel and like Fallon and all those guys like record like midday and then air at ten o'clock at night? Yeah, I've been to those shows. Like so disappointing. It is. It kind of sucks. It it's does. Freezing. Those, those the studio is freezing. They keep it at like fifty degrees. It's insane. Yeah, because the lights on on like the the. Oh, the, that's a good point. I was wondering the about lights that. are really Smart. hot. The Head lights not. are really hot. So hot. Yeah, I had no idea. What? Okay, good. Yeah, I went to a Letterman show. This is before this whole scandal with his intern or whatever. Uh, but I could totally, yeah, I could totally see it happening. Where I was like, cancel, oh, God. cancel culture. I'm with Elon <laughs> cancel Musk. Cancel culture. I'm with Elon Musk on that one. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you can't really cancel somebody just for doing one thing, right? So. You shouldn't be able to cancel 
someone for a mistake they made. We are humans. No one is perfect. You should be able to cancel someone if they killed someone. I agree. If they raped someone. This is getting dark, but no. I can go with you. I will go no, with you. No, no. I mean, we're at the end of the podcast. Most people have tuned out at this point. The people <laughs> oh, that yeah. have stayed in are the people who are like, you suck. And I'm going to get like, you know, I, I, I did a podcast and, and, and I had death threats after that one. But what um, the hell? Like, That's not cool. I, I, I do another podcast called Goodbye Privacy. Oh, You'd like that one. It's all about conspiracy theories of like how oh, big companies yeah. like spy on you and so I forth. Yeah. Season one, I had death threats. Dude. Like I was getting email from people telling me like I'm a whack job. Or I had people from, you, you know, you should look into this conspiracy theory. And like, what did you say? Like, well, I, I didn't. So here's the thing. I wasn't saying anything that wasn't in a legal contract on a terms of use and privacy policy of one of the major networks. Oh, okay. All right. And then I have one episode, probably our most watched episode on YouTube, and it's um, Walmart versus Amazon and how they're completely taking over the online retail. And yep, all guess true. what? This pandemic has proven it. Oh, totally. In fact, I think Amazon's winning, right? I well, don't think Walmart's doing anything special. Well, Walmart isn't doing anything. Well, Walmart's doing a lot of... So Walmart has more inventory than Amazon, believe it or oh, not. Oh, really? You're kidding. I did not know like, that. Like, a lot of people are buying gloves and stuff from mm. Walmart because Amazon is like... You can't even get Purell on Amazon. Okay, so those commodities kind of thing. Not like a random pop filter for a microphone that I had to get for my guy. No, and and oh and by the way, yeah, thank you, Amazon, for replacing this one because the first one came through and it wasn't in the in, in at all. It, like it wasn't in the envelope. Mm. <laughs> it wasn't even there. It wasn't even like I was oh so excited. God. I was like, I got my pop filter. I got my pop yeah. filter. Like I run. Like you know, you get the message that you got your there. Amazon package with the and picture. They take a picture of it, <laughs> right? So like I run up the stairs. Like my wife's like, what's going on? I'm like a dog waiting to go outside, like, wagging my tail, like. <laughs> And it was My like, pop it's filter light. is here. <laughs> and then I, I'm like, it's open. And then I'm like, what the? And so I look <gasps> at my ring doorbell because I thought someone stole it. I'm like, who yeah, would yeah. steal a pop filter? <laughs> nope. Nope. They, if they stole it, they stole it in the Amazon truck. They needed a pop filter. They got a podcast. You know, they got doing the, Amazon truck podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe that's that's actually a pretty good podcast, by the way. But anyways, on Goodbye Privacy, I did a bunch of I, I did a bunch of different podcasts, um, kind of like showing how different um, companies around America and like with Amazon versus Walmart, I've shown their entire network of companies in retail, like all the different companies they've bought and acquired over the last wow. like five years. Wow. Okay. All right. Very yeah. very detailed. Yeah. Great research went into that episode. Huh. And of how they're cornering the market. And how like Amazon has like a 50-year strategy and Walmart has like a 70-year strategy on this stuff. Whoa. All right. You are getting in a little deep. Wow. Well, I mean, that's what capitalism is. Right. right? <laughs> well, so companies are able to work in a way that's very effective to, to their shareholders. And their shareholders are looking at share price now, but they want to know that this company is going to be around 10 years down the road. And look at Amazon. Amazon's greatest wish was that more people would buy clothes from amazon and you know what did that COVID 19. oh no one could buy clothes and guess what most people oh, what's that like if you look I, i'm so i'm on season two of goodbye privacy and it's all about election security but i wanted to do a follow-up because i had to stop midway through because we did our first episode and then rsa happened COVID happened lockdown happened and i was like okay i'm gonna like before i put more content out i'm gonna start to do some research less stuff bring in and then bring it all in and so i'm bringing it all in now and looking at amazon's um like most bought items beyond ppes like what's the number one increase category beyond ppes i clothes. guess clothes because yeah. no one had a lot of comfortable clothes most yeah, people have right. one or two pairs of pajamas but now you're working from home i'm completely wearing pajamas right now me too yeah <laughs> Like, seriously, I'm wearing sweatpants. That's what I wear. At least you're wearing pants. That's great. Yeah. Some people don't. I've, I've seen the Zoom stuff. I've seen oh, it. Oh, Jesus. I've seen it. It's horrible. <laughs> I, I know this is uh, yeah, just capitalism run amok, but I mean, what are, what are we going to do about it? What do you think the American people can do? Rise up? Well, Fight the tyranny. Socialism. We need it. No, God, no. <laughs> I knew that. No, no, no. 
Never. I'm all for I was trying to pull your strings. I'm all for companies acquiring and doing what's best for their cap for for their shareholders for the company. And when a, a com- company like Amazon acquires a specific small company that has a unique technology, they're helping that company excel. Like th- there's th- 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 those people who are probably uh, starting in that company are middle class, right? Just making buy Amazon buys them, they become uh, upper middle class or rich, right? They become millionaires. So. And that progressively goes down. There, that's very, very effective. My thing about that is, if you know Andrew Yang, everyone remember Andrew? I don't know I if you fucking he, love Andrew Yang. Are you kidding me right so, now? So Andrew Yang, I I tried to have him on the podcast multiple times. I've sent him like a bunch of stuff to have him on the podcast because I said the government doesn't need to give people a thousand dollars a month for that they don't need to do that you know what you can do you can pass a bill that says that companies that only make money off of your data by selling it to advertisers by selling it to data analytics firms by selling it to data brokers have to pay the user something yes yes that's what andrew yang wanted no he didn't want that he wanted the government to just give people a thousand dollars a year but paid for by value added tax of those companies. I don't want to value add tax those companies. Let those companies do what they do. The government doesn't need to take more tax from them because if they, you take more tax from them, it's going to limit the jobs that they that they put out. It, it's going to have a trickle down effect. When government increases taxes on business, businesses either increases its cost or de- and decreases its operating cost. That's the way they make make up for it. Period. End of discussion. So you're not, and he's not blind. He's an entrepreneur. He knows exactly what that means, right? But but if you go to companies like Facebook, who make their money predominantly off of selling your data, so that yep. people can put ads, yeah, and they make billions and billions of dollars for it, so they can set tiered plans of people, so you can make 150 bucks a month if you give very limited, like location and two preferences. But if you're willing to give your entire profile, you can make $1,500 a yeah, month. Yeah, everyone's gonna be a content creator eventually. Right, well, we're all content creators now. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right, yeah. Right. But even more so, it's just gonna be like the way people make money, well, right. YouTube. Twitter, same thing. Twitter only makes money by you tweeting. Yep. And selling your data. So mm-hmm. Twitter has to pay you something from what they make. I'm not saying be a partner. Because obviously they've taken all the risk, they've built the business, they maintain the platform, they secure the platform, they go and get those marketing partners, they manage the ads. The, no one's saying, give me 50 or 20 or 10% of that. Pay me a flat fee. Same thing with Google. Google purely makes money off of our web browsing. Mm-hmm. Google would have me killed for what I'm about to say. <laughs> okay, I'll be a witness. But is it, but but it, it is absolutely that. But I, we went way off track. You know, way I, I love it. We can talk about anything, really. Yes, we can. I feel you. I feel you. But no, so, I just wish it turned out differently with this COVID thing. But um, what's one I'm thing you took? Here. So, so final question of this fire round is what's? Oh, geez, we're still on that. Okay. There's one more. What's one All thing right. you took away from COVID? Oh, uh, Jesus. Uh, hmm. I. Well, I don't know. You're 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 a pandemic fanatic. What's I one am. thing you took away from it? So many so many thoughts right now. Hmm. Well, there's a hell is other people, I guess, but that's not really a single word. <laughs> who said that? Satar, satar, sartar. Like who's the the philosopher? Hell is other people. Socrates. No. No, S A T R E or something. Sartar. So I can't pronounce it. Sartar. Sartar. There you go. Sorry, it wasn't a one-word answer. I was like, "What's a one-word answer for this?" No, it's okay. It doesn't have to be a one-word answer. Yeah, there's so many layers to that, but hell is other people. Unfortunately, that is that is very true. There's two people that are gonna for sure make money after this pandemic: maternity wards and divorce lawyers. (laughs) Done. 
uh, are people trying to make babies now? I feel like that is so irresponsible. So some, a lot of people are making babies. Like I expect that we're going to have what we call the Corona babies in nine months. Yeah, and, like, and they're all going to be ma- named Rona. <laughs> mark my words. There will be stories on Good Morning America and every single shitty news network on the fucking planet. That's yeah, bookmark this. Bookmark right? this. Yeah. That's going to yeah. be like, this baby was made during the pandemic and <laughs> their grandma died. And now it's named after their grandma, Grandma. Martha. Grandma died from Corona, but little Martha was born in Corona. (laughs) The cycle of the pandemic. The cycle continues. Life is beautiful. Oh, God, no. Yeah, that's going to be exactly what's going to happen. And I already see the news story and I see people go. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, gosh. Listen, anything for the eyeballs, I'm telling you. Cliche. Seriously. All right. Well, that was Thank good. Thank you for coming I, on the podcast. Hell yeah. I had a great time. You were awesome. Me. Sorry for the technical difficulties for, especially to you, Naomi. I wanted this to be perfect, but Aww. dolphins. I speak whale. <laughs> <laughs> you know that reference? Hell yeah. Yes. You're a cool dude. Yes. You are very, very cool as well. Thank you for, so much for coming on the show, folks. The one, the only, Naomi Buckwalter. Fam, love you guys. um, She's, her LinkedIn profile is linked in the description to the podcast. She is tagged in the social media posts. You can find her in the description part of this YouTube video. I'm on Twitter, but it's a shit show. I'm warning you now. Follow her on Twitter, please. (laughs) Only Twitter. If you want the shit show. (laughs) Follow her on Twitter. (laughs) If you got anything from the last part of our conversation, follow her on Twitter. Yeah. We will there be going go. at this. We will continue our discussion about politics and pandemics on Twitter. <laughs> you can follow <laughs> both of us, James underscore Azar one and, and conspiracy theories. Yes. What's your Twitter handle? It's I need more cyber. I need more cyber. Yeah, it's like I need more cowbell, but not really. I need cowbell. <laughs> I feel like explaining it. Kind I got of a fever, it. and the only prescription fever. for that fever is more cowbell. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. I feel less stupid now for explaining it. And if you haven't seen that Saturday Night Live, this was when Saturday Night Live was good. Not what it is today. This is true. Yeah. Not what it is today. When Saturday Night Live was not political, it was cultural. And it made fun of culture. Everyone. No exemption. Right. No one can forget Will Ferrell in the American Bikini. No. After 9-11. Yeah. After ni- that was a classic. Mm-hmm. Night of the Roxbury started on saturday night live and if you haven't mm. seen that at the roxbury turn in your cards right now and go home <laughs> just go you've lost your cyber cards you've lost your cyber cards don't even ask us what certs you should take go watch night <laughs> of the roxbury the come back yeah. with a night of the roxbury reference and not one from youtube either <laughs> better yet tattoo it on your arm <laughs> exactly <laughs> Yeah. I didn't mean to break the window. All right. That's <laughs> <laughs> that's it for us here, guys. Um, we could keep going, but it's getting late. That's it. Thank you so much for listening, Naomi. Thank you so much for being on. Make sure you subscribe, give us five stars, review us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Siso Talk more next week with another exciting Siso. Until then, folks, most important thing is to stay healthy. But over that, stay cyber safe. This is James Azar signing off.